design team, but after seeing A Quiet Place, I know that these guys are rock stars. We're going to learn about their part in creating the most stressful movie I've seen so far this year, today on On The Fly Filmmaking. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. Hey everybody, welcome to On The Fly Filmmaking. Today I have the amazing sound design team behind A Quiet Place, a movie that's all about sounds and really, really stressful. Really, really stressful. So thank you guys for joining me today. Our pleasure. Our Great pleasure. to be here. Awesome. So today I have got Eric Adal. Eric Adal. Uh, Brandon Jones and Ethan Vanderine, who are the team behind the sound of A Quiet Place, or e2sound.com, if you want to check out some of their other work. And uh, oh, I'm just so excited to talk to you guys today. Yeah, um, great to talk to you too. Yeah, have you been doing a lot of, I, I know you've been in a lot of articles. Have you done a, a podcast interview yet? No podcast. No yet. podcast? Well, well, just some stupid small stuff like New York Times and that kind of thing. Well, <laughs> small <laughs> potatoes. You're on On The Fly Filmmaking now. You've made it. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming with us today. So today we're going to chat about um, sound design and where it fits in the filmmaking scheme. A lot of times people don't think about sound design, uh, especially when you're working on, on smaller budget things or when you're first getting started. Like when I first started, I was just like, I don't know sound design, like whatever comes in through the camera, we'll just use that. But right. it's a totally different thing. And when you watch a movie like The Quiet Place, which is, or A Quiet Place, which is just so reliant on sound, you really notice it, and that's that's I feel is what's happening with you guys here. That's right. Yeah, yeah. rock stars, <laughs> sound designer, rock stars. Okay, so so talk to me a little bit about what it is that you guys do uh, in the process of sound design. Well, in in the process of sound design, we basically construct everything that you hear that's not music. And then, uh, but then are a part of choosing what the balances are, what we play and what we don't play. And with a movie like uh, A Quiet Place, sound is in the DNA of this film. Mm -hmm. Sound is survival, sound is danger, sound is death if you make too big a sound. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, for us, it's like a sound designer's dream. Uh, we can really play with audiences' emotions and just, uh, Ironically, by taking out sound, it makes it even more terrifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. It really, really did. It's this like absence of something that makes you really notice when something comes back. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what were your guys' parts in? in this because I know you guys worked on a team are there like mm -hmm. specific roles that you have or do you guys just pass back and forth the same collaborative effort? So well, it was really, really, go ahead, Brad. It was really a team effort just putting our heads together and seeing what worked and um, Working with John was just amazing because he's super enthusiastic and, and he had such a, a passion and vision for the movie. And so, um, yeah, like Eric said, when when they told me I was going to work on this one, I was just so excited because the sky is the limit for what we can do with sound. So yeah. it was really exciting. It's nice to like have something come across your plate and you're like, this is like a good, yummy challenge. Oh, yeah. Like, Let me 100%. shine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then how about for you? Uh, yeah, you know, when we first read the script um, almost a year ago, we were just so excited because it was clear from, from the script that this was going to be an incredible mm -hmm. experience to be able to work on this movie. So once it had been shot and we started working on it, um, you know, our dreams started coming true because we were able to sort of make these moments really come to life and mm -hmm. turn it into something... Uh, that it hadn't become yet. It really sort of evolved once we started working on it um, yeah. into something really special. Yeah, well, I can't wait to hear about that process. Uh, before we get into that, I want to learn a little bit about how you guys got to here as your role in the sound design team. So, uh, yeah, Ethan, let me know. How did you get to here? Did you always start in sound design, or did you come from somewhere else and uh, end up in this magical place? Well, <laughs> you know, I sort of started. I was living, um, I went to a film school up in the Bay Area, and the Bay Area is a little hotbed of sound work that grew, uh, sound people that grew up around uh, Francis Coppola and George Lucas. And I was lucky enough to get a job as a sort of editorial gopher working um, this uh, before Skywalker Ranch, which is George Lucas's post-production facility. I worked at the sort of previous incarnation of that um, as an editorial gopher and then I just sort of moved up the ranks. This was actually before everything went digital so we still cut sound on 35 millimeter magnetic film, uh, cut everything, mm -hmm. all the sounds, cut them with splicers, hung them in a bin, then they would mm -hmm. all get patched together with tape. 
It was a whole different process. Totally then, different game. Um, mm. But it was. I'm glad I had that experience to live through. And then a few years later, I was effects editing um, on Terminator 2, which we did all of that. Never on, heard of it. Oh my god! It's like I, I just got so excited. It's like one of my favorite movies ever. I spent a <laughs> year. Like a lot of people. I, I spent a year on that film doing all, um, almost all of the field sound effects, field recording. We call it where we record all the vehicles and the motorcycles and. Mm. I got uh, nearly got arrested like three or four times because a lot of that a lot of that work there wasn't crazy enough there's like a hundred and fifty million dollar movie there was no real budget for recording sound so it was just so up would you to say us. you had to do some stuff on the fly we had mm. to absolutely do stuff on the fly I did a lot of recording of, of sound out in the <laughs> national park um, you know where I could do it without letting anyone know and we would just rent cars drive them out there be crazy and <laughs> then drive away before the rangers could come and try and yeah like you hear us. this like folks at home like even terminator 2 you had to just go out and get some stuff done <laughs> like we can do this we can make these movies so how did you mm -hmm. get to this point brandon uh, well, the short story is I'm a failed musician, so that's a lot of... Cool. Uh, <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Well, I started out in music school as a classical guitar player, mm -hmm. and um, it's kind of a... I made a funny segue um, after trying to do that for several years, and it wasn't really happening, um, but I always, I always had a love and appreciation for film, and um, so I, I think it was... Uh, uh, watching the DVD commentary for um, for Lord of the Rings when I saw the special on sound design and lo and, lo and behold Mr. Van Der Rijn right here worked on that one and so I remember watching his interviews and just being totally inspired just just opened up my eyes to the world of sound design and um, so I, I worked independently on a lot of small independent films little short student films here and there and then uh, eventually got an opportunity to uh, to do sound design on a horror film that ended up being picked up by New Line Cinema. It was called The Gallows. And uh, just through that whole process, I met these guys, and uh, uh, amazingly, they, they hired me to work with them. So. Oh, my gosh. And, and Brandon, now there's somebody sitting at home who, like, saw your name in the credits for this movie, <laughs> is watching this interview, and is going to inspire to go down this path. Yep, Full exactly. Yeah. Nice. Very, yeah. very nice. <laughs> All right, and Eric, how did you get here? Well, car, um, bus, plane, <laughs> <laughs> car to the studio. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I started out um, when I was a kid just for fun, making my own movies, and I would edit them like tape to tape, like VHS, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and uh, I had this little eight channel Audio Technica like sound mixer. So I'd like, and it, you know, there's no automation back then, it wasn't digital. Mm -hmm. So you'd hit play hit record over here, hit play on the CD for the music track you want, then you have the sound effect queued up and you hit play there and you just kind of like, you know, <laughs> try not to F it up. And if yeah. you do, yeah, you gotta roll all the way back to the head of that, whatever that cue was and start over. And um, and that was just for fun, and um, I didn't. I never thought that I could actually make a living doing this kind of thing. Um, and so I wound up uh, going double majoring, uh, doing pre med, and also doing film studies um, at USC. And uh, I just fell in love with film, and then decided, okay, I'm going all in um, my third year. Yeah. And then just happened to get a job as an assistant um, on NYPD Blue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I did a year of that, and then became a sound effects editor. And um, then I started supervising and got into features. And a few years after that, met Ethan. And the first film we collaborated on was Transformers, and that was about uh, 12 years ago. This, yeah. This fall. Oh my gosh, Transformers so. is 12 years old. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, when we started on it, okay. it was 12 years ago. Yeah. But still, like that movie's been a while. Like I loved that movie, and it's so interesting that you are uh, of our recent guests, the second person that we've talked to that was pursuing medical and film, oh, really? and mm -hmm. then like ended up like picking film because it was more. Creative way harder. Fulfilling. Yeah, it's a different game. Like where you're like a, you're stressed out. You're both stressed out just the same. But like one, you're actually mm -hmm. saving lives, and the other ones, you're like <laughs> virtually saving lives or threatening them. Yeah, a little bit. Depends. It depends. Okay, so then how did E2 Sound come about? 
Well, um, so after the first Transformers film, uh, Ethan and I realized that we had a really great working relationship and we just wanted to make it official. So um, we put together our operation and um, we started putting together awesome um, crew members and their team and have really inspired people such as Brandon. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that was, how long ago was that now? About oh, it was about ten or eleven years ago. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it was like yeah. right after Transformers. Right after like, we're besties. Like, we want to keep this going and mm -hmm. just keep working on great films, doing great work, and, and working with people who inspire us and building a team where everyone is collaborating and it's all about the work. And yeah, that's what we do. That's fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. So. Uh, I think this of of your work is probably one of the the things where you guys have really shown shown shined. You're really sparkly <laughs> in this movie. I'm really glad that you guys were brought on to a quiet place and let's check out the trailer to that right now. So stressful. So <laughs> stressful. Uh, if you guys haven't seen A Quiet Place yet, definitely go and see it. And I, I, I advise you to, to prepare yourself with some quiet snacks, because never have I been so scared to eat popcorn mm -hmm. uh, in a movie theater. But I do suggest you see this in a movie theater, because that really, like, being immersed in this, like, dark space with a bunch of strangers mm -hmm. watching this very big movie on a big screen, like, added to it a lot. So I don't know how this would feel <laughs> at home. Because sometimes when I watch yeah. movies at home, I'm like, oh, I want to check Facebook. I'm going to hang out over here too. But mm -hmm. you're like, see this in the movie theater. And see sure. it right, right away. Mm -hmm. So how did you guys get involved with this movie? Well, um, let's see. Uh, we'd worked with the producers before. Obviously, Michael Bay is a producer. We'd done seven films um, for Michael. And, uh, and uh, Andrew Form and Brad Fuller, um, who run Platinum Dunes with Michael, uh, we'd worked with several times as well. Um, so uh, I think they pitched to John, like, hey, there's some guys I want you to meet, and you know, we'll throw them the script, you guys can have a meeting, see if you hit it off, if not, find someone else. And anyways, we uh, read the script, we were blown away by how awesome it was, <laughs> and mm -hmm. and also how um, just part of the DNA sound was mm -hmm. in this film. So um, went to the meeting and um, had all these ideas. And actually, before said anything, um, John was like, "This is the sound designer's dream," and I was like, well, "That's what yeah. we were gonna say." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, so, anyways, uh, flash forward. How many months? Another seven months. The film was had been shot, and uh, we all came aboard and just and started uh, just jamming on it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. yeah, that's so great. So you guys have a history of like 
creating sounds for stuff that doesn't quite exist. So like this movie has a, a creature in it. You're creating sounds like you like the whole like Transformers world, and you guys did also Godzilla, mm -hmm. right? That's like right. you're you're used to creating sounds, but like also loud big explosions. And this one is very much the mm. opposite of that. Yeah. yeah. Mostly. Yeah. It's a nice change of pace for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so when you look at the script for this, like for you guys as sound designers, like what what starts going through your mind on like an initial pass? Mm. Uh, the first reaction I had was, this is going to be really hard. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's not like you can hide under all these sounds, and, you know, yeah. obviously there wasn't going to be wall-to-wall -wall musical score. Um, we were just going to be naked. Every little detail you'd be able to hear. And mm -hmm. so the first reaction was like, holy crap, this is going to be challenging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the second reaction was, oh, my God, um, so many ideas you know mm -hmm. there's a daughter in the film that's deaf mm -hmm. and her character the character is deaf but the actress who plays her is also deaf and here's this amazing opportunity to play with sound and perspective and uh and we didn't quite know what we were going to do with the way she experienced the world until we really started working on um, the very first sequence and uh, that's where we tried creating this, um, what John wound up calling her envelope. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of her sonic perspective, her sonic point of view, mm. which um, was a much lower kind of hum um, that she could kind of hear through her um, cochlear implant, her hearing aid. So um, it immediately, right off the bat, puts you right in the shoes of the character, mm -hmm. which is so thrilling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, because you yeah. not only you have like the the base level of what most of the characters experience of the sound, mm -hmm. then you have her experience of the sound with her her hearing aid, mm -hmm. and then her experience with no sound. Yeah, yeah she the, turns it off. Yeah, and it's like yeah. it's so fascinating because it really makes you feel like the different levels of fear yeah. that you can be getting here because like just because she is deaf doesn't mean she knows like what is quiet and what isn't because she yeah. can't hear when a sound goes off. Well, it's really amazing the, yeah. the all the different tiers of sound that became available throughout mm -hmm. the movie because like you said it's there's absolute silence at the very bottom mm -hmm. where she has it turned off and then there's the hum her envelope when it's turned on and then you know the various gradations of backgrounds through the whole movie from when they're at the waterfall the, as the loudest and when they're at the river which is a little quieter and mm -hmm. um, also, the, the background spaces, too, like when they um, go in the basement underneath the, uh, the mattress, mm -hmm. that's like a, a safe, you know, soundproof room. And so we took all the backgrounds out completely. That was absolute silence. All you hear is the production track, um, yeah. whatever dialogue or movement or, or breath mm -hmm. is going on. And so, little Foley cloth. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, is so neat uh, because I, I something I did notice because a, a lot of the movie they're at a farm, and there's no farm animal sounds as like so mm -hmm. that as a visual was quite interesting because you're like oh no this like no rooster was gonna make mm -hmm. it no, that rooster's dead it's gone <laughs> sorry rooster yep. all the hens dead yeah and like even any like, flightless bird is basically dead yeah. in the yeah. world really really fascinating because you don't normally see that but then you start thinking of like it's not explicitly explained. Like that, it's not an exposition, but you're like, whoa! There's mm. no animals. Like those yeah, little creatures yeah. did not make it. Yeah, those little yeah. critters. And so, uh, with that, then, where you guys are creating the sound, and you're you get the the movie after it's shot to start working on the sound design. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, some some movies will start working on the sound before they're even shot, before the script is even finished. Um, in this one, we really started digging in once it was shot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you guys spend much time on set to kind of like feel what they were doing? No, none at all. Yeah, not at all. Mm -hmm. Like, forget it. You guys have a great time. <laughs> and so then you get it. So then once you get the footage, what happens next in your process? Well, <clears throat> we started with really two sequences. The opening of the film was the first one. And this is when and they're in the convenience store? Convenience store all the way through the trestle the bridge, bridge okay. and the first attack. Mm -hmm. no, no spoilers here, right? No, <laughs> please don't. <Okay. no. laughs> and, <laughs> and then the second sequence was on the, um, a cornfield scene, and it's the first time that um, the daughter interacts with one of the creatures. Mm -hmm. So, And those were kind of our first proof of concept kind of sequences where we were testing out how low we can get with sound and how quiet we could get and also creating some of the sonic logic of how her hearing aid her cochlear implant works um, and how it might have some sort of interaction yeah um, mm -hmm. with the world around her yeah so um, and then once we kind of unlocked 
that puzzle that kind of informed the rest of the movie. Yeah. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like those. So. It, those seem like two really good scenes to like, like you said, unlock the skill set for the rest. Because you're like, cool. This is our coloring box now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now Color. we have a language that we all, you know, agree on, and the filmmakers are like, okay, yes, that works with our storytelling and. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it's very much always like an exploration and experimentation, mm -hmm. and you never quite know where you're going to wind up, but you just keep working on it and exploring yeah. and trying new things. And ultimately, like, we're our own hardest critics. Like, yeah. We're trying to, with the sound, impress ourselves. You're just like and all of us impress. artists, all of everybody <laughs> is their hardest critic. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And you got to embrace that. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, it's um, you're not done until they pull it out of your hands yeah. and, and then it's in the theater the next day. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. So then even on set, they didn't have a concept of what the critter sound like or anything like that. They well, no, I think they did know. I mean, I it, uh, from what we were told, and we weren't there, but from what we were told, it was a really disciplined and quiet set. Oh. They didn't let the grips go stomping around and walkies weren't going. It was, everyone really followed the rules, mm -hmm. like even the crew, not just the actors, but just yeah. everybody. And I think that creates a kind of spell mm -hmm. that everyone kind of, you know, it, it just infuses itself into the performances and yeah. you know, the incredible mm -hmm. cinematography. Just every part of the art of making a movie um, uh, benefited from yeah. that. And it mm -hmm. drizzled all the way down into the audiences. Like doing mm -hmm. that, like I feel like it, it really it seeped into the movie. So as an audience member, like everyone in the movie theater with me was stressed out. Yeah. Like the guy next <laughs> to me was like, <gasps> <laughs> like I like I sneezed or something and my sister looked at me like she was gonna stab me in the face. <laughs> She's like, We're gonna die now because of you. So, so is everybody in the audience really trying to be quiet too? Yeah. So, like and then you're yeah. like holding your yeah. breath a little yeah. bit with the characters because you're you're trying to not like get them in trouble. Yeah. Right? We made you a yeah. part of the movie. Yeah, it was so like really, really fascinating, which I think is is something like to be said about sound design because like you yeah. can mm. see visuals, but like once you're like immersed in like all of your senses, mm. then you were in for a ride. And it did mm. feel like a ride to me. Awesome. So That's great. you did you guys did a great job. So uh, <laughs> as far as your like the the sound envelope then in the storytelling, like that was a, an accidental thing that you guys came up with afterwards when you guys were working on it, right? So it's not what they were doing there. So then how did you guys work with like the editing team? Well, it was, it was interesting actually because as we started working with some of these concepts and specifically the idea of, of sonic envelopes for the characters, the editing um, was one thing that really had to change where mm. to sort of adapt to where the sound design was going. Cause as we started working on these envelopes, we needed we realized we needed close-ups. For instance, we needed close-ups on Millicent, the the actress who plays the deaf daughter, uh, and 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 similarly uh, with the creature who we wanted to create this sonic uh, envelope for, we realized we needed a close-up of the ear to 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 get into. And then when we started working with the close-up that, that ILM provided us with, we realized we needed more time with that close-up to really be able to let this sort of amplified sound mm -hmm. that the creature was hearing blossom. Yes. Mm. And so this is this was a great example of how once we started working on the sound design, the picture editing needed to adapt a little bit to, mm -hmm. to serve that purpose. Did they have to go yeah. back and reshoot anything for you guys? No, um, you know, some of it was the v VFX, which were happening concurrently with our work, mm -hmm. so that was able to adapt. There was there was actually a pickup shoot that happened, and I don't think any of that was specifically oriented around servicing, you know, or helping the, the sound design mm -hmm. work. Yeah, and then so a lot of the sounds that, that are in there, most of them are natural sounds, and we've got some creature stuff, but are there any of the natural sounds that were made in a not natural way? Like, they're, they're like walking on flour or something like that. You guys like, I just imagine sand, you guys sand, like in sand, your, mm -hmm. your office, like, you're like, okay, listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the uh, the sand, so um, our, our Foley was shot in uh, Toronto, mm -hmm. a company called um, uh, Foley One. Foley One. And uh, they recently finished um, uh, Shape of Water. Okay. And uh, we thought they did an amazing job. Yeah. So it's the first time we'd worked with them. 
And uh, so those little details, like the close-up of a foot compressing mm -hmm. grain, granules of sand, mm -hmm. they recorded that and did a beautiful job on those little details. Mm -hmm. um, other things that you'd think would be fully we handled in the sound effects side of the, of the experience. Um, and in case people yeah. don't know, Foley is... Foley is recorded on a stage mm -hmm. to picture in time to picture. And so those are like so. the, the audio cues that are like on picture that are being yeah. recorded. And it's typically things like, yeah, it's typically things like human footsteps. In this case, it wasn't any of the creature mm -hmm. footsteps. Um, cloth movement, l those little details, mm -hmm. like intimate little details like that would be Foley. And... and uh, not to say that we don't record, we only record things on a Foley stage, you know, uh, our team, it's the, our whole philosophy is to record everything, use fresh ingredients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We kind of think of it like cooking, you mm -hmm. know, you can go get some canned food and yes. put it and heat mm -hmm. it up, or you can grow your own vegetables and cook fresh. And so we like to do all of our own fresh recording. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, which just translates better and feels more real. Good example of that is uh, um, I, my wife and I watched our nephew, uh, his name is Jackson. He was uh, two months old at the time, back in January. And uh, I was, I just heard about this movie uh, that, that I was gonna be working on, A Quiet Place, and uh, and so I thought, hmm, I think, I think there's a baby in this movie, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm just gonna set my recorder out and record him all weekend, and he was luckily a really noisy baby. Yeah. So he made noise all the time, and so I recorded him cooing, coughing, crying, you know, uh, drinking from a bottle. And uh, so I think like 90% of the baby vocals in the movie are, are my nephew. So, yeah. Uh, Don't I, tell that to the actor baby. Uh oh, actor <laughs> baby's going to be so bad. <laughs> Is there a sag issue here? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, just a great example of like just using fresh ingredients because there's, you know, baby cry audio that we've heard a thousand times in TV shows and movies and just to get fresh ingredients in there is really important. Yeah. What other kind mm. of fresh ingredients did you use? Like anything really weird? I asked this because like we had a guest uh, once that was a did, did audio and he said that he used he's he a composer but he was trying to make weird music and he used dildos on a drum. <laughs> I just thought it was hilarious. So like anything Whatever fun sounds like that. Good. Whatever yeah. sounds good. It's because yeah. like, you just don't know because you're experimenting. Like yeah. you're just uh -huh. like sure. I don't know. That might be weird. Well, totally. I did, did a lot of recording to try to get the right sounds for the creature footsteps and what their claws hitting wood you know stairs sounds like and. Mm -hmm. You just have to record a ton of different things and see what works because you really don't know. I mean, you can have an idea in your head like, oh, this would be perfect for the creature claw going down. But then once you record it and put it in, it doesn't work. Right. So you have to try a hundred different things. things and just and, and different combinations, layering. Uh, um, mm -hmm. So it's really uh, it's really an abstract art. You really have to just you know, yeah. wing it and go for it and see right. what works. So then, so you guys, you get the, the footage, you're working on your sound design, you outsource to Foley for some mm -hmm. things, and you guys create some other things yourself? Yeah, and then we create most of it yeah. ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly the creatures were a big challenge, and the mm -hmm. creature vocals, mm -hmm. which Brandon's mentioning <coughs> abstract art. You know, there's mm -hmm. no... <gasps> it's the act, baby? There's no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no actual creature you'd like that you can go out and record. Yeah. So you're piecing no, I, it I together. asked the guys beforehand, I was like, which one of you is the voice of the, the monster? And they're like, we're not going to tell you. <laughs> it's definitely the baby. <laughs> <laughs> there's something to be said for mystery, yes, too. You definitely. Know, that actually kind of makes it scarier, I yeah. think, and especially yeah. for this film. Because um, it is like otherworldly, and you want it to feel unreal. Absolutely. Yeah, and and you don't want an audience to think about, oh, that's mm -hmm. you know, that's a toucan chirping in the jungle. You know, you don't. Yeah. Yes. You don't want people to think about that. You want them to be immersed in the mm -hmm. film and totally believe what's happening. Yeah, because exactly. you're you're creating this like invisible layer that you don't want people to really be paying too much attention to, but they are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. And that's what that's part of the power of sound too, is you can be so you can use something totally different and be so manipulative and abstract, but um, the audience won't know it if you do it right. Yeah. And in that way, you know, mm -hmm. Walter Murch had this great quote where he said, images come in through the front door, but sound comes in through the back door. Yeah, I feel that. Mm -hmm. That's really wonderful. Yeah, so we can really be puppet masters mm -hmm. of emotion and tension and, uh, mm -hmm. 
and with it not being as obvious sometimes yeah where we can just get everyone to hold their breath and you don't let them go until the credits roll right That's which is fun. exactly like I, it brings me back to what you were saying about the the one the frequency sound like blossoming like mm -hmm. whenever that happened like if, if that just happened quickly and it just went straight to like high frequency it'd be like a jolt but not the same feeling as it like growing like you felt it you're just like, ah, yeah, and, and in that particular case, we also wanted that we wanted to sell the idea that the creature had the ability to, you know, hear all this sound and then be able to sort of sonically strip away layers mm -hmm. and focus in on one particular sound. So we mm. really needed we needed enough time to to make that happen, you know, because in, initially, you know, we might have had like two or three seconds holding on on the on the ear where we. And that's just not enough time to yeah. make that happen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, sound is the most interesting when it has a progression, when it when it goes, you know, when it evolves right. over time. Mm -hmm. And so we, we try and do that moment to moment so that we never have, you know, static right. anything. Which is like a little bit different than a lot of other horror movies that I see when it's like a, a quick jump. Like you see yep. somebody in a mirror, there's a loud noise, everyone's like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And then we're moving on to the next thing. But it's like kind of a false sense mm -hmm. of fear it's just mm -hmm. like a, yeah. a quick scare where this movie i feel like you guys did a great job of like these slow burn scares of like, oh, tension <laughs> long arcs yeah. we do have a couple of jump scares but yes. i feel mm -hmm. like uh it was earned yeah they were like know? used well <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, because you have it, it's a it's a, it was a nice juxtaposition to these this other type of fear that you guys were yeah. were building in me and everyone else in that room. So <laughs> really really great. So uh, I'd love to um, hear you guys' insights and tips for indie filmmakers who uh, maybe are still learning and they don't quite have a sound department to go to. They're mm -hmm. just trying to make stuff themselves. Like what do you suggest for them? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing <laughs> is to you want to tell the story mm -hmm. like whatever you do with your sound it's in service of the storytelling the mood the characters um and i would say the next thing is to first train yourself to really listen yeah you know and listen to your favorite movies and then try to you know um uh mimic that or or just listen to reality um i think I think we tune out a lot right. um, in these modern times, you know. We kind of tune out and we stop listening and uh, everything's there's sort of a veil over everything and um, because there's so much stimulus and there's so much noise. Right. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so, but I think, you know, being able to do what these creatures do, which is open up your ears all the way mm -hmm. and truly listen and to start to strip out the noise and focus in on certain things is a useful trick for right. filmmakers. Yeah, because um, like I, I have mentioned many times on this show, like sound and music is not my strongest suit. Like I work very much in the visual, but I've been working on it and like doing multiple passes when watching a movie where like you watch it once for entertainment value and for story, just like to get what they were trying to give you as an audience member. Mm -hmm. Then I'll mm -hmm. watch it again for cinematography and like mm -hmm. what kind of shots were chosen and why. And then like I've started to add on listening like for the sound and the music cues. And it's like really helping because you're like, mm -hmm. pick pick the thing and focus because they're yeah. so like it's just this big machine of so many people and collaborative totally. efforts to make this really a wonderful piece of art. And you know, and it's so easy to um, overdo things mm -hmm. and mess them just add layers and you know, we've got the technology these days to be able to play a thousand tracks against each other mm -hmm. at once. And that's a recipe for a wall of noise and mud. Yeah. You know, sound is like color. And you start mixing colors on the canvas, eventually it's going to turn brown. Mm -hmm. And so if you can find the one sound that really is important in, in any given time, that's going to be the best thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in a way, like, less is more, you know. Yeah. Restrain mm -hmm. yourself. Like, pick, be, make some choices, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, cause, uh, that's what sounds good. Yeah. And so then if, uh, you know, so we've got our, our filmmakers in their small town, they don't have somebody else to help them. They go out with their little point and shoot camera. They're mm -hmm. making a film. What do they need to do next to record some sound for sound design? Well, whatever, whatever tool they have to be able to record, mm -hmm. use it. And they could use the, uh, mic on the camera if mm -hmm. that's all they have. Um, find a quiet place to record. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you don't need to do it to picture all the time. Most of what we record, we do not do to picture. Mm -hmm. We go out and just collect the materials and 
And oftentimes um, you're kind of surprised by, you know, serendipity happens and you're surprised by some happy accident and you go, oh my gosh, that'll totally work for them. Yeah. I, I didn't plan on that. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, these days you can do an, an amazing amount of audio editing um, on your laptop. Yeah. And so just start to get that palette of sounds and start putting the pieces together. Yeah, and, totally. Like yeah. you can use your phone to record sound. Totally. Like I, I've used it for, I've sat in a closet in a hotel room and mm -hmm. did a voiceover yeah. on my phone because I needed to send it off. And I was like, if this is what we're working with, they're like, oh, I would have not known it was on your phone. One of my favorite yeah. wins I've ever recorded in, in my life was on my iPhone because yeah. I had left my <laughs> recording rig at home. And we were like in the mountains and it was windy and the door jam was making this whistling sound and I'm like, okay, iPhone yeah. in there. And that made it into Transformers 3, Chernobyl. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. So then uh, how about for you guys? Like you, you've been in the industry for a really long time. What mm -hmm. do you suggest for somebody who knows they want to get or like feels like they want to go into sound design specifically? Mm -hmm. What do you suggest for them as far as research and education? Well... I mean, I think it's really about just starting to do it because like we're talking about now, it's the technology makes it so easy. You can, you can, you can start recording on your iPhone, you know, and it's, I think the most important thing to do is what Eric just mentioned, you know, just start listening, you know, open up your ears and, and, and try and isolate details in the world and then start, you know, recording details. And then obviously the next step is to, take them back and start work, you know, working with them, whether it be on your laptop or within Pro Tools or however, you know, the technology has made it so, so easy just to get going. And I, I think the most important thing is just to start playing with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I suggest to people who are, or just want to get into filmmaking at all. And they're like, oh, I don't know if I would like be able to do this. I was like, get Premiere, like get it for the month, go in there and play. Once you yeah. learn the quick keys, it's mm -hmm. just a video game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that, all of this, I just feel like it's just a video game. Like, go in there, it's like so much fun once you figure out like all the commands that you need and you learn your color. So it's it's art, so it's, mm -hmm. it's going there. Like, so would Pro Tools, what you suggest to somebody who's starting out, is that what you guys are still using? We use Pro Tools. Yeah. yeah. Brandon, you've done a lot of work on um, low budget, independent oh, yeah. movies. Yeah. Maybe you have some insight into well, I mean, it's really just more more of what these guys have already said. Uh, recording as much as you can. I bought a H1 Zoom. It's a little ninety nine dollar mm -hmm. thing I got on Amazon, and I still use it today because it's it's small. It fits in your pocket, and whenever you hear a cool sound, you can pull it out and and you know record it. And um, do you have like a, a large library of sounds oh, yeah. at this point? Oh yeah, for sure. How long have you been? Capturing. I've been I've been recording stuff for about ten years, and yeah. I've I've collected a lot of backgrounds, just funny sounds I hear. Are you an organized guy? Like, is it easy to go through your library? Yes, yeah. yes. I'm a little type A about. Oh, that. that's good. That's good because like I was like I have photos and like video clips of everything. But yeah. I don't know where to find yeah. any of it. Yeah. I'm just like, it's... is it on my Instagram feed in the last like twenty days? Maybe we'll get to it. <laughs> We've got databases for every show. Yeah. Where every every sound has a tag and a number and metadata descriptions, so yep. you can type in. Whistly wind and you know, you get a yep. ton of fresh, you know, mm -hmm. freshly recorded stuff from our past films. Yeah, I mean, it, you got to record a lot of stuff, and if you know, if it's not labeled cor uh, correctly, you can't find it, then it's no good. So, then it's useless. you got to be yeah. organized, but um. Uh, but I, th I think what Ethan said, just, just doing it, you have to, you know, you have to trial and error, try things, see what works, what doesn't work. Um, I think my first gig was for 200 bucks. It was for a little 10 minute uh, UCLA student film. And I found this guy on Craigslist and he said, I've got a short film, I need a sound designer. I'm like, I'll do it. And uh, of course, it, I I worked way too long on it, and you know I was probably making you know thirty cents per hour by the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it was a great experience, and um, he kind of put me through the ringer. But we got a really good sounding product at the end, and he re referred me to his friends, and then I, I started you know doing bigger and bigger films from there and yeah. then here i am years later working with these are. guys so i'm still all started from myself. watching an interview <laughs> yeah. you. And were you working on pro tools or i sure was yeah. yeah yeah i mean there, there's other editing you know software out there for sure but um if you want to get into the industry you have to know pro tools i would say i mean yeah that's gonna be industry some, standard yeah mm -hmm. i know some sound designers that that work in other programs but they always end up transferring it over to Pro Tools, and then that's how they deliver it mm -hmm. to the mix stage or wherever. So, right. Are there yeah. any movies that you guys take inspiration from as far as like sound design stuff? 
Well, there's a movie that Ethan worked on called Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. It's pretty <laughs> blew me away when I saw that. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's yeah. a good one. That's a good one to pull from. <laughs> yeah, that that opening sequence, I just watch it over and over again, just just to you know, with my eyes closed, to to you know take it all in it's just an incredible yeah and that's yeah. one of those that really u utilizes the layers of sounds oh, yeah. and like blooming mm -hmm. of different things because like isn't that where like there's explosions happen and sometimes you can't hear things yep. and you mm -hmm. hear like little things and they come back to you it's going underwater yeah. and yeah. above water it's it's all about perspective like that it's really and the, cool. the other the other comparison i would make with that movie and a quiet place is is the way that music is used in that movie because mm -hmm. uh spielberg knew actually going in that he wanted to use music in a very specific way and he knew that he didn't want to have it playing in any of the battle sequences because he wanted the he wanted the audience to feel like they were in the middle of the action mm. and he wanted it to be very very visceral yeah and it's an you know music has um one of its interesting things that it does is it is it um it works on us in a way that um it it takes away the visceralness of the experience hmm. in some ways as soon as we hear music we're like oh okay i'm in a movie as opposed to oh man i'm like in the middle of this experience yeah yeah and you know obviously in a in a quiet place we we make a lot of use of that mm -hmm. idea of wanting the audience really to be sucked in to the experience and yeah. feel like this could be happening to them or mm -hmm. it is happening to them and i think that's part of what makes it so tense is that very specific way that music is used mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i think that you guys definitely achieved it because i'm like still worried about making too much noise okay. <laughs> still worried. and then like you guys there's like one song that was utilized mm -hmm. in the movie yeah mm -hmm. and then the way that that came in was you know, through headphones, like it was mm -hmm. intentional mm -hmm. part of the story. Yeah. Like, so you never were drawn out of like, oh, right. there's a song. Right. You yeah. know, yeah. there yeah. were some music, some other music cues that were yeah. in there, mm -hmm. but those were more like storytelling, like, and they were subtle enough that it didn't like bring you out. You were just, it was part of the feeling. Yeah. 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 Marco Beltrami was the music composer, mm -hmm. um, and he's he's an incredible storyteller, mm -hmm. and uh, and also and is one of these composers who um, actually listens to our sound design as he composes oh, okay. so everything so kind of works together and we listen to the music that he's writing mm -hmm. and mm. so that everything you know we can start to construct it in a way where everything works yeah. together mm. and um so uh, kudos to marco because yeah. it easily could have been like a bombastic silly mm -hmm. experience but his, his score was like emotionally it illuminating was. And, yeah. And yeah. yeah really really so. good so then so they shoot it you guys get the footage does it go to you first or the editors first uh, well the picture editor uh, makes sort of a first assembly mm -hmm. of all the dailies and gets the film into some sort of shape and then usually it's and that's for the director's cut period mm -hmm. where the director gets to do whatever he wants and in this film it's pretty much the whole process where the director got to do whatever he wants yeah. fortunately <laughs> that's not always the case but as soon as um the picture editor and the director get their kind of first cut it comes to us and mm -hmm. we, we start uh, mm -hmm. working away at it. yeah and then so working with the director in in like somebody who's directing your sound design what kind of notes do you get so they're like here's my script this is what i'm feeling make it scarier yeah <laughs> more okay. scary more scary yeah is that, did you hear that a lot from john <laughs> well specifically i'm thinking about the creature design which we yeah. we sort of went around some um some circles with but it was really trying to figure out how to how to get it scarier mm -hmm. absolutely yeah and a lot of that was wound up being subtraction mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know just um taking some of it out so that you've got these quiet still spaces between mm -hmm. the vocals yeah. and and which is kind of counterintuitive you think oh you make it scary you just start adding stuff but right. no yeah. it's start Finding the negative space, stripping right. things away. Yeah. So it's a little bit opposite of, uh, so we talk about like, I was surprised that they showed the creature in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and then like, sometimes you get more tension in movies when they're not, like visually you don't see what mm -hmm. the monster is. So you're doing the same with sound, where like you're yeah. you're creating tension with, like what we were speaking about before mm -hmm. was the negative space. Yeah. Because you're paying attention to what you do see. Yeah. And you're like just freaked out by what you don't. 
Well, yeah, some of the scariest some of the scariest parts in the movie are where you you don't know where the creature is, and so when it's quiet and you you know it's around somewhere, but you can't hear its vocals, so you're like, okay, I know it's in that part of the house. Um, just that that silence, that dead silence of dread, is mm -hmm. really powerful. Did and, you guys yeah. see the creature? Like, did you have like sketches, like to know what to work with beforehand? Somewhat. We got a few still images. We, we had a on, motion but... a guy in a mocap suit. That's what <laughs> oh, we had. Yeah. Actually, yeah. actually, it was John. A lot it was, of it was John <laughs> in a mocap suit. He, uh, he did. Acting. He ended up playing yeah. the creature in a in a bunch yeah. of the scenes yeah. um, because it's like, well, this is going to be quicker because I know what I, I already know. wanted mm -hmm. to be doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, for for a while, it was it was. Yeah. It was John, and they actually had a screening um, that was that way with him, and people just laughed in the in the screening. So it's like, uh, okay, I guess that didn't work. You know, the creature the creature uh, visual design actually happened kind of late, so we did a lot of work without you know before we had any of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, they, they yeah. did a great job though because like the design wise, it it uses a lot of like audio and sound like technology in like mm. the design of what this creature would be totally which would make it have this ability that it does totally and we don't want to spoil it we yeah. want people to go check it yeah. out for themselves you definitely see it. but um the visual effects supervisor is scott farrar mm -hmm. who we worked with on every transformers film world war z um, he's a real oh, artist. So he knows it's, how to make creatures. He too. knows yeah. how to do it. That's he's, amazing. he's talented. He's got a future, that guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think he's going to be okay. Uh, do you guys have any lessons from uh, mistakes that you've made on the way? Hmm. Brandon? Uh, <laughs> well, I made the most mistakes. Someone I made the most mistakes. Yeah, which is great. It's great. Well, mm. I, I, kind of what these guys were talking about earlier, it, it's sometimes less is more. Like, you, as a sound designer, you, re you really have to find the right sound instead of, you know, we have a tendency to just keep layering until it sounds scary or whatever. But it's, it's, um, it's harder to find the right one sound than to just put five sounds together and have it kind of sound like something and then you can move on. So um, working with Ethan and Eric has just been incredible because sometimes I can get in this rut where I try to create these little moments that are cool and kind of showcase sound design. But these guys are great about, you know, bigger picture, what serves the movie, what serves the story. And, you know, that experience is just invaluable. So um, these guys would put me back on track and, you know, oh, you don't have to do something cool there. Let's, let's save it for later. Let's keep it really silent and stealthy. And, and so, um, yeah, I think uh, that's one of my biggest lessons. Just less is more. Less you know? is more, yeah, yeah, which is like you guys have brought up tons of times in this mm -hmm. interview. So I think that's an awesome. Is there any, any other lessons you guys want to share? So our, our mm. filmmakers out there, our budding mm -hmm. filmmakers. Our, our Bozo the Clown Horn experiment didn't work for some reason. <laughs> that got nixed. Yeah? Just kidding. No, yeah, yeah. you, you didn't try that? Not on this uh, one? <laughs> no dildos on drums? <laughs> <laughs> that's for the sequel. Yeah, this is for the second one. I'm sure there's uh yeah, I'm, I'm just blanking on some of our some of our mistakes, mistakes and random little things, but well, uh, there's a mil it's I yeah. remember at one point we were just just you know, going off this note that John had, make it scarier, and, and so we thought, let's just make it really shrieky. So I had a really cool recording of a, of a kitchen drawer that was just really gnarly and, and grating. And uh, we started peppering that in, but it was just, it was too much. It was mm -hmm. silly, and so we took that out. And so um, it, it's just this constant, you know, it's like cooking a meal that you don't have the recipe to. It's like you have to keep trying things until it until it works out, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of trial and error. <laughs> yeah, that's great, and that's like so much of all of filmmaking in every department. Mm -hmm. So much yeah. trial and error, yeah. but you know you have to go out there and, and do it. So any other uh, tips just for filmmakers and creatives out there in working with the sound team? Uh, yeah, the most mm -hmm. important thing is remembering that sound is 50% of the experience. <laughs> you use your sight and you use your ears. Mm -hmm. Front yeah, door, back yeah. door. Yeah. That's right, exactly. <laughs> um, so that, that's the first thing. And um, yeah, uh, I would say put some budget and effort into, into sound and your mm -hmm. sound team. It shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be part of yeah. the uh, DNA of the movie, and, which is what this made this movie such a pleasure yeah yeah and get get the sound team involved early, early. like you know yeah. give them the script get some back you know back and forth they might have some ideas for you yeah, yeah. Up a they little. Just might. <laughs> and then is the, is the sound guy on set part of your team no. no, he's like a different Production team. sound mixer, um, yeah, is uh, independent. And obviously we're all working together towards mm -hmm. the same goal. 
Um, but uh, and you know, different movies we have different levels of interaction with production sound mixers. Um, you know, sometimes on noisy sets, they need us to listen to the recordings and see if they're clean upable mm -hmm. and those kind of things. Um, but on this fil film, the sound production mixer was in his own little quiet world. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I've had to do sound on, on some like short films and I hate it because I just, I feel like I'm in a bubble. I'm mm. like holding the boom mic and mm. like, that gets somebody tiring. talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> like, Cause they're like, you're just invisible. You don't exist because yeah. you're just supposed to be capturing things. Booms mm. in the shot. Yeah. I'm so sorry. My arms hurt so much. I'm not meant for this. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me. Yeah. Uh, everybody at home, definitely go see A Quiet Place, especially while it's still in theaters. It is amazing. And uh, yeah, check, check these guys out at e2sound.com, e2sound.com. Yeah. Uh, if you want to see more filmmaking tips, you can follow On The Fly Filmmaking on YouTube, on the Popcorn Talk Network. Also, you can find us on iTunes if you want to listen on podcasts. And if you want to follow my crazy antics traveling around the planet, uh, Marilyn Mantle, all over the internet. So we will catch you next time on On The Fly Filmmaking. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For quick questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals. We don't